Good evening and welcome. I'm Javita Hill. I'm the Executive Director of the Philadelphia Commission for Women and the Office of Engagement for Women. Since our establishment in 2015, uh, passed by a, a unanimous ballot initiative, we have taken very seriously our mandate for gender equity and justice that has included wage equity, access to affordable childcare, addressing maternal mortality disparities, access to affordable housing, and fair work week scheduling that ensures workers in retail, fast food, and hospitality industries have predictable work schedules. The Domestic Workers Bill of Rights offers first-time protections for domestic workers against wage theft and sexual harassment. The legislation also provides for paid sick leave and vacation leave. And get this, it's transportable from one employer to another. We were instrumental in reforming the city's sexual harassment policy and we remain tireless advocates on behalf of dignity for incarcerated women. In Philadelphia, incarcerated pregnant women can no longer be shackled during labor. Women being held in Philadelphia detention centers now have access to free menstrual hygiene products, but this is not true of our state prisons. But we are working on advocacy on behalf of the Dignity for Incarcerated Women Act to ensure that women in labor will no longer be shackled. And it includes access to free menstrual products and sentencing closer to where women live so families can visit them. Thank you for joining us this evening for the ninth installment of our Women's History Month virtual series, Your Voice, Your Power, Your Vote, Making Democracy Work. Uh, we dedicated this series uh, to Harriet Tubman, who was tireless advocate. We know a lot about um, Harriet Tubman in terms of her abolition, but a lot of people are not aware that post-Civil War, um, in later years, she was an advocate for universal voting rights. And so we are equally adamant about um, access to the ballot a pillar of our democracy that we saw in peril on January 6th. And since then, we have not seen such an aggressive attack on voting rights emblematic of the 1950s and 60s and the Jim Crow era. So, so what we're talking about and, and the series of programs has been very important. And next month, we'll be doing a program on mobilizing the Latino vote. So stay tuned and, ch and um, check back with us for when that's going to be scheduled. But we also know, as we eyewitness the invasion of Ukraine, we know of the fragility of democracy. We also know that it was women and particularly black and brown women that made it possible uh, to win historic Senate races in Georgia and made it possible to have the first black Asian American woman as vice president of the United States. So with all of that being said, um, it gives me great pleasure to introduce our panelists. Washington Post columnist, Jennifer Rubin, whose latest book, Resistance, how Women Saved Democracy from Donald Trump, inspired tonight's conversation. She is also a frequent contributor to MSNBC. Natasha Brown is no stranger to Philadelphia audiences. This is her third appearance for the Philadelphia Commission for Women during Women's History Month. Natasha is also a frequent contributor to MSNBC. And I'm also happy to welcome Kadita Kenner, founder and executive director of the New Pennsylvania Project, a voting rights advocacy and mobilization organization. So thank you all for being with us this evening. So I would like to start with you, Jennifer. Your book has a very provocative title, 
resistance, how women saved democracy from Donald Trump. Elaborate on that, tell us what you mean and tell us what you found out in, in doing this book. First of all, thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to be here on a great topic at a great time of year. So thank you for that. The book was inspired really by two things. Uh, one, as I looked around after the 2016 election, I saw really an outpouring of civic activity, new organizations, new efforts at lobbying, new efforts in uh, public demonstration. And when I looked more carefully, I saw that these were primarily, not exclusively, but primarily driven by women. And I thought it was not a story that was being told as the, quote, resistance was being covered. Um, and it was so notable to me that I felt as if you were um, reading about the civil rights movement without mentioning African-American leaders. Um, it, was, it was somewhat bizarre in my mind. And the second was that I really, on that fateful evening, like many of us in November on uh, election night 2016, I was stunned, I was shocked, I was gravely disappointed in the American electorate. And I wondered whether we had it in us to not only uh, maintain democracy, but to come back, um, to restore a greater level of civic participation, to um, make sure that our civil liberties were not in danger, to uphold our democratic norms and institutions. And as I watched this unfold, um, to my really um, delight, I saw that we hadn't quite blown it yet. And what the book is really about is women from all walks of life, some of them already in Congress, some of them who ran for office the first time, some who were never political and went from a group of five or six women to networks of 2,000, 3,000 people who were then politically active. And it was really a marvelous example of what democracy should be. It's a participatory sport. You can't sit on the sidelines. And as we know, women turned out in great numbers, 2018. Um, many women Democrats ran for office, many more than in the past. There was a record number of winning women candidates in 2018. And then in 2020, we, for the first time, had a political party that had multiple women, not just the woman candidate, but multiple women. And eventually, um, as uh, our host said, um, a woman vice president. But we also saw in the presidential election phenomenal efforts by women. African-American women leading the way as they usually do in the Democratic Party, but also college educated women who um, we saw some shift um, from uh, Republican to Democrat um, and some people who had been Republicans who could no longer tolerate their party and uh, join the movement to elect Joe Biden. So it's a story, I think, of um, disappointment, of anger, but also of triumph. And uh, I think it comes at a timely moment because we are still faced with these very same threats to democracy. And one could make the argument that the threats are more acute now than they were um, in the uh, tail end of the Trump administration. We had January 6th, we've had massive assaults on voting rights. We've had an effort to subvert the administration of elections so that we can um, no longer absolutely be sure that the counting and the tabulation will be done by nonpartisan people. We've seen all sorts of threats um, against people in public office, whether it's school board members, whether it's members of Congress, whether it's election officials. And so the battle is not yet won. Um, we pulled back from the precipice in 2016, um, but I cannot stress enough how fragile our democracy is, um, just as was said um, in, uh, as we watch Ukraine put their lives on the line, their children's lives on the line. And I fear that if we are exhausted, complacent, 
somewhat disappointed because um, not of all of the policy objectives um, were obtained, that there will be devastating losses for the Democrats, that the Republican Party will come back into power. And just as I wrote today, we're going to have chaos. We're going to have an attempt to impeach the president. We're going to have gridlock. We're going to have government shutdowns. We're going to have a fear of defaulting on the debt. Um, it's really going to be a mess. And so uh, I'm thrilled to be here um, to once again ring the alarm um, that once more uh, democracy hangs in the balance. Thank you. One of the things that confounds me that at this time, when we see all of these um, assaults on democracy, that there is a real fissure within women. I mean, so we have an attack on abortion rights. We have attack on women's rights. I mean, it's astounding to me, and it's astounding to me how women were at the front of the resistance movement, but by the same time, there are all of these assaults on women's rights. How do you explain that? It is unfortunately a very common pattern in American life that women or African-Americans or immigrants make progress and then there is a tremendous backlash. And what we're seeing now is an almost frantic anger um, by um, the right wing that is elevating whiteness and Christianity as the defining features of uh, being an American, which is completely contrary to our founding documents and the American experiment. And this is, make no mistake, this is pushback, this is revenge, and this is an effort to say, we're not gonna let those people organize. We're not gonna let all those people turn out at the polls next time, because look what happened when they did their work in 2018 and then in 2020. And so I think it is not at all coincidental that there is a very, very deliberate attack on women's rights, on uh, the rights of African-Americans, the rights of poor women uh, and men, um, and that this is what uh, the right wing does. Um, just as they did after Barack Obama, there was progress and then a tremendous backlash, which was part of how we got Donald Trump. So I think we need to be aware of it. And I think the Democratic Party needs to be a little bit more forthright about what's going on. And to be clear that we're talking, it's not just a discrete issue. This is about the fundamental dignity of women. When you have a statute that says other people can spy on you and then turn in your abortion for money, we're talking about a complete abrogation of uh, individual integrity, individual self-determination um, of a type that we have not seen in, in quite a long time. And you see it um, with any group that the right wing perceives as vulnerable. Um, did you think you would ever see a statute passed in the state of Texas that said the government can come and take your child away from you if you pursue appropriate medical care that's something out of the gulag. And that's a very important point that I would hope Democrats, independents, disaffected Republicans make. This is all about the gigantic growth of really a tyrannical surveillance state, that the power that they want to give to government to run your life, whether it's your childbirth, whether it's how you raise your child, whether it's the ability to send your child to a school that accurately teaches American history, this is a giant power grab. And it's accompanied by a movement to prevent people from voting because these things are not really that popular. Um, and the way they stay in power is by disabling people from voting. This is the ultimate in incumbent protection. Um, if they prevent you and everyone tuning in and millions of other people from exercising their right to vote because they fear they'll be thrown out. And I think it's I think also anti -dem I think we also need to express and the underpinning of this, why our democracy is so fragile, because these movements to 
um, to impede on, on people's rights are anti-democratic. And I think we need to be really clear that it's anti-democratic. Absolutely. You do not have, have a democracy. people running around calling patriots who are anti-democratic. Yes. I mean, it's really amazing. You have, and they're completely shameless about it. They say, well, it's better if fewer people vote. That's not democracy. Um, they say that, well, um, they're only, the real Americans are this group of people, completely contrary to what democracy stands for. Um, the view that they are somehow entitled to retain power at the expense of a growing majority of um, millennials, uh, black and brown Americans, of women, um, is really the antithesis of democracy. They are rejecting democracy because they can no longer win a majority support for their agenda, which is very extreme, very kooky. And so they have chosen that they're going to choose their right-wing, theocratic, frankly, racist agenda that in order to get that, well, democracy has to go by the wayside. Um, we can't have too much democracy because then this extreme agenda can't possibly get through. And they're shameless about it. Um, unfortunately, I think uh, people in the center and on the left are not as skilled in calling it out and making clear to the average American why this is a threat to them um, and why this is going to make um, their lives um, worse. Uh, and uh, I would hope as we get closer to the election that the administration, members of Congress, candidates would be far more vocal and far more precise in identifying this uh, phenomenon. And which is why, which is, excuse me, which is no, uh, please. for interrupting you, but which is why all of those things you have said, I think, Latasha, for years now, you have been working in response to exactly that. Tell us about your work um, and the work that you have been doing in expanding the franchise. So thank you, Anjavita, for having me. And I really appreciate, Jennifer, I really appreciate your analysis and insight. You know, I, I want to, um, um, before I just talk about kind of my work, I want to talk about my work in the context of what moment I think we're in. You know, part of the challenge of what is happening, we're going to have to be honest that we've had a revisionist history of this country. This country has never been, has never been a pure democracy as is laid out in the Constitution. It has been aspirational and there's aspects of our, our, of, of, of our society. There are aspects of government, including primarily the franchise of the vote. But I do want to remind people that you know even as this country as the founders wrote that all men are created equal and endowed by their creator they also had a system that completely marginalized people of color as well as even white people who didn't own land including white men couldn't vote right and so there's always been an element in this country that defined democracy in a context that meant democracy for themselves and not for others and so i think that where we're at in this moment which has created the tension you know while on one hand is extremely frustrating. The good news is that the tension has been created because the electorate, the political landscape has changed drastically. That what we are seeing is we're seeing more women run for office and win in office. There are more women that have been elected to the House of Representatives ever in the history of this country. We're seeing more women actually challenge seats, including Secretary of State, you know, including your own state that I think is on the precipice of having a woman as a Secretary of State. You know, and, and, and we're seeing women run for governorships um, and gubernatorial elections. We're also seeing communities of color being represented in ways that we've not seen before in terms of that is shifting the political landscape. And so in fact, what is happening and what is happening is that those same tricks that have worked in the past, that this is Custer's last stand, that in some way, this is this model that has been around power being defined of white patriarchy supremacy, that that has been the standard and everything outside of that um, is antithetical, is antithetical to what democracy means. We 
flipped this thing on its head because we're making democracy. And so part of my work is actually in the practice of creating democracy. And how you create democracy is that you have an informed, engaged electorate that see themselves as not just being participants in the governance process, but also see their power as citizens that the constitution does not say we the political parties, it does not say we the candidates, it does not say we the elected, it says we the people. And so what we are doing is the work to make that be real and to be that and make that be sustained. And so we do that in a number of ways of with Black Voters Matter, which I am, I should announce, I'm the co-founder of this organization. Part of what we wanted to do is to create an organization to make democracy in a way that what we would do is actually help build out the ecosystem of people being engaged in the process. What does that look like? The 40% of the population in this country oftentimes or don't even bother to vote to participate in the election. And there's been this narrative is that's the people that don't care. No, I would actually offer that those are those are people that it's not that they don't care. Those are people that have literally been either disenfranchised, like disillusioned, pushed out of the process, discouraged from voting or various placed up, right? That part of what is happening you're saying that people don't care about having affordable homes. People don't care about um, make, getting paid uh, for the work that they do. Come on. That people don't care about having good schools and good neighborhoods. I've not met anyone that did not care about something. But what we've had is we've had a, a political process that has been created and exploited in such a way that it seeks to serve such a, a small group of people, the ruling class, primarily white men, right? And that everybody else that is engaged in the process had to engage in this process using the democratic process to actually engage. And so now those very those very levers, you know, are now being, being um, pushed back, right? Because democracy sounds great. <laughs> <laughs> um, of, of when you are in charge. Democracy is not so great when the majority of people don't look like you, don't have the same kind of context. And so I'm raising this because I want us to flip from seeing that we're a perpetual victim and really recognize that what is happening in this moment, there is a power shift. That essentially what is happening is we are really reshifting the entire political landscape in this country. I want to remind people that at one point, regardless of whether you are on the, on the, 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 uh, how you see yourselves in terms of party affiliation or whether you're progressive or conservative, you have to acknowledge that someone named Barack Hussein Obama to be president um, of this nation, that could not have taken place 100 years ago. I'm not even sure that could have happened 50 years ago. I'm raising that because I want us to recognize that in the midst of the fight, that what we are also seeing, that fight is in response to the progress. And so there's progress being made and we have to really recognize if democracy is to be so the people, we the people are going to have to take that serious and we're going to have to make that be so. And a case in point, I just would say in terms of some of the work that we've done, you know, we've worked in, in 12 states, including Pennsylvania is a key state for us. And I just want to acknowledge and put this out. We are looking to work with and we've worked with so many great grassroots groups in, in Pennsylvania, but we are completely open and would love to connect with organizations that are doing power building work. And the way that we define that is not just about the context of who does civic engagement work, that that ultimately, who is on the front on, on the front lines making change in our community? That is what democracy looks like. Those women organizations that are doing leadership development training and are creating a context for communities to get engaged. That's who we're looking for. Those groups that always show up when there's a challenge happening in that community to actually leverage their power and resources, those are the groups that we're connecting with. And so our approach has been, we believe that you build, the way you build democracy is not from the top down, it's from the ground up. And so in that context, last year, we were able to support over 700 black led groups, some of them in, in, the, in the great state of, of Pennsylvania, which is a core key state for us. And we invested $10 million directly, which means we wrote checks. Um, to those grassroots groups to actually help them build their capacity, whether that was paying for a van so they could actually help get this work out, whether that was canvassers, whether there was providing tools for them, in addition to that, providing tools for them, um, like uh, technology support from millions of folks. I think we contacted 10 million people. I can't even remember the numbers. 
it might've been 12 million um, through our text messaging campaigns, whether that was leveraging the media, we actually use the media as a tool, as an intervention to shift the paradigm of how we see ourselves in this political shaping. That is, we're, if we're gonna reshape the political landscape, we gotta shift the focal point. The focal point can't be around political parties or political candidates, it has to be around the people. And how do you do that? You build campaigns that center people. And so for us, we shifted from the traditional model of that there's only an election or only a campaign that is led by a political party or by a candidate, because there's a vested interest, not saying that anything is wrong with that necessarily, but that's a vested interest in a particular kind of approach. We wanted to create another approach that would democratize the process so that what we were actually fighting and lifting up were people, that our campaign message would be centered around how do we mobilize a constituency base for their own interests, that it wasn't centered around having a charismatic candidate or waiting on what the party thought was important, but what people thought were important. And part of us doing that is we actually worked on um, doing a lot of, of local races from anything as, as small as a school board race to a DA's race that we felt like that if we're engaging and we're building out an ecosystem that we can constantly respond and that we're not looking at building political power in this very exploitive cycle that normally, particularly, I can say this as, as someone who's worked on campaigns for 27 years of my life, that normally what happens is there is a candidate that's running or a party that needs help, they need this black vote, and what they do is we see them three weeks before the election, and a, and a few dollars rain from the sky, or just a few coins rain from the sky, and then the election happens, and whether they lose or win, we never see them again until the next election, and so we wanted to disrupt that's that cycle that we would work 365 days of the year, whether there's an election going or not, that we continue to work with our partners, right? Because there's always that our goal is ultimately how do we shift actually people being placed in power, right? So that we're making decisions around what governs us, what policy is in place, and actually having a leadership pipeline as well. And the last point that I'll make kind of related to that around our work is that those three buckets, I'll say movement, mobilization, moving money and message. Those were our three points around how do we do our work. And part of us doing our work, I'll give a case in point in Georgia, which that's where we're based. And that's where um, um, some people kind of recognize our work nationally, that in Georgia, part of what we did is in 2018. That's why I think it's really important for us to not get caught up in this cycle of win and lose and who wins and who loses. And if we lose an election, then that means work wasn't done. The contrary, our goal is ultimately how do you build out the ecosystem? And so in 2000 and it's in 2018, uh, 2018, essentially what we wound up doing, you know, that was a gubernatorial election. And in that gubernatorial election, what it seemed like is it seemed like I, my grandson is coming in. Uh, hey, Makai, um, our, our uh, 2018 election, it seemed like there was this loss, right? That there was this charismatic candidate that many of us supported. Um, I'm talking to my C4 side now, um, uh, Stacey Abrams, that brought a lot of energy um, um, to the process, right? And so in that election, we didn't get the outcome that we wanted. But instead of letting that energy dissipate, what we did is redirect that energy to be to organize. And what happened in 2020, in spite of the voter suppression, in spite of COVID, we came back stronger and bolder, and we came out in greater numbers in those pieces. All that was was good organizing, y'all. We took what seemed like it was an attack, right? That a, that was an attack. I can tell you about in 2020 where we were in line up until 12.37 a.m. on Wednesday when the last voter voted. People stood in line for hours, up to 11 hours. And so part of what we did is we were like, yeah, with, with, at, at the end of the day, we have to see this moment. As a, as, as a transformational moment. We have to stop seeing democracy as a transaction around like this musical chairs. Who are we gonna put in the seat this year? Who's gonna put in next year? We literally have to recognize that this is a moment for us to radically reimagine what democracy looks like in this nation, that we've gotta have accountable leadership and we've gotta actually put in the infrastructure so that we can hold them accountable, that we can create the kind of policies that we want and we can actually go forward with a new radical reimagination of how we want want our communities to look, to be governed, how the, there's participatory budgeting, and how there's a truly a dem democratic process that we're all engaged in. Wow. Thank you. Thank you for that.
And you should see the, the chat is blowing up, Latasha, in terms of people saying yes. And good trouble, good trouble. Um, thank yeah, you. Yeah, we like good trouble. We do a lot of good trouble now. We like good trouble. <laughs> and so that, um, so I'd like now for you, Kadita, to let us know about the new Pennsylvania project. Map, map that out for us and let us know, A, what that is, what it's doing in Pennsylvania, and specifically, because I think this is mostly a Philadelphia audience, how does that relate to us here in Philadelphia? So the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Javita. Uh, pleasure being here today. I never want to follow after Latasha, and here I am. So <laughs> I'm going to give it my best go. Um, so I'll say this, you know, Latasha mentioned the New Georgia project, uh, you know, Black Voters Matter as well, all those that were doing great work there in Georgia. And that worked and just end in Georgia, right? Because groups like ours, the New Pennsylvania project, the New North Carolina project, all popped up in reference uh, to the work that was done down in Georgia, trying to duplicate those efforts. And that's what the new Pennsylvania project is all about. Now, no, we do not have the same demographics as the Georgia, uh, but we do have a very growing population of communities of color here in the Commonwealth. Numbers up to almost 27% of those living in the Commonwealth being someone of color. And so we have lots of work to do. And as an organization, uh, we are looking to register to vote or re-register to vote uh, the 1.7 million Pennsylvanians currently living here in the Commonwealth who are eligible to vote and not registered. That's what the new Pennsylvania project was founded to do. And there's not a lot of organizations that wanna get into um, this voter registration work. There's a lot of liability behind it. There's a lot of uh, quality control that must go into it to ensure that we're doing things accurately and ensuring that those that we say we're registering to vote actually get registered to vote so that they can actually get out and then vote, the second part of that. Um, and so that is where we're dedicating our time. We call ourselves a voting rights organization with a primary focus on voter registration. We're gonna register 50,000 Pennsylvanians in the Commonwealth here, 50,000 Pennsylvanians to vote in 2022. And that's going to be a tremendous effort and it's gonna take a lot of support and help to do that. Um, obviously we know here in Pennsylvania, we have lots of obstacles before us. We have a state legislature um, hell bent on putting additional barriers in front of voters here in the Commonwealth, uh, trying to take the ball and run with it when things don't go their way. I've seen you know, things that have happened in the Westchester area school district as of late. Um, what is happening as it relates to um, usurping their authority over our judicial branch of government here and our state leg and our state judiciary. Um, so lots of attempts to attack uh, democracy in this moment. And which Latasha alluded to is that people are just disillusioned in this moment. Uh, they're disenfranchised politically due to bad acts like the gerrymander that goes on here in the Commonwealth or functionally. They don't see themselves being represented in government and they don't see that government is doing anything to make their lives better. And so you think about the fact that there are 1.7 million Pennsylvanians who are eligible to vote, but not registered in, that, in this moment. And there's a reason for that. And so we're knocking on doors, we're tabling, we're standing outside grocery stores, we're in their beauty salons. We are hiring folks from within the community, the trusted messenger, to engage folks within the community to begin to get their needs met and to have a more representative democracy. Currently here in Pennsylvania, our legislature is 90% white, more than 70% male. That is not what Pennsylvania looks like. And if we're going to get people to, to come out um, and, and cast their ballot at the polls or work around the system where they're not even sure if they're able to vote by mail anymore, because that's uh, lots of disinformation and disruption about that um, opportunity here with Act 77 here in the Commonwealth. People are having a hard time trying to make it to the polls and whether or not they want to go through the hassle uh, because of the additional barriers that folks want to put in front of them here in the Commonwealth. And when you're working two and three jobs because we're stuck at 7.25 an hour here is a minimum wage, um, you're going to spend your time with your children with their homework and, and cooking dinner versus standing in line for three hours at the polls. Kadita, for people who don't know what Act 77 is, would you explain to people what Act 77 is and how it is impacting um, all of us here in Pennsylvania? You know, if, if we would have known that COVID was coming our way, we wouldn't have known how important Act 77 would have been here in Pennsylvania. So Act 77 received bipartisan support, and it changed the way in which we were actually able to cast ballots here. It allowed us to have essentially early voting by voting by mail 
which gives folks the opportunity to cast the ballot safely and securely um, and take it home with them. You know, they're, they're receiving this ballot at home. They're able to sit around the dining room table, talk as a family about who's going to re best represent their family um, in the state legislature and beyond. And so we had a really productive election here in 2020 and everyone stayed safe because we had Act 77 in place where we were able to cast ballots by the mail, um, where we were able to have early voting so those who were working two and three jobs could find the time to complete a ballot and turn that in. It had bipartisan support, I'll keep reiterating that. Um, and it had our partisan support until results looked a little differently than some might have wanted it perhaps to look. Um, and then there are these attempts now to overturn Act 77, which will continue to be ruled unconstitutional, you know, uh, unconstitutional here in the Commonwealth. The Pennsylvania Supreme Court already ruled that Act 77 is the law of the land and we will continue to vote by mail. We will continue to make it to the polls and have our day of celebration at the polls. And um, we just need to make sure that uh, we're making it easier for Pennsylvanians to cast a ballot, not harder. And I think I'm a believer now. I used to think early voting and, and voting by mail, all those things were anti-civic engagement. I have never missed an election since 1972. That was the year 18 year olds were first allowed to vote. And I have voted every time, like I said, since 1972. And I also spent 17 years as a committee person. And so I loved election day. I loved because it was something that all of the neighbors do all together. So you've got your division and you get to see people and talk. Act 77 has changed that. And I think more or less COVID changed that because that meant there were so many people. Um, it was a new way of voting and folks wanted to vote and they figured out how to do it and they did it. And so I'm really very, very proud of the way uh, Philadelphians and Pennsylvanians uh, rock the vote. Yes. I, I do want to I want to add something, Javita. Um, one, I am as well. That's why we are watching. I am so happy that we're um, that we're working in the state. And um, I love the work that the new Pennsylvania project is doing. So I just want to lift up like like that can catalyze what happens in the state. So I just can't stress that enough how that can really be catalytic. But I also want to uh, want us to think about, you know, unfortunately we deal with 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 voting like it's a rocket science. Everything is shifted. The way that we get our movies is shifted, right? We used to go to Blockbuster. Now we get Netflix. I mean, we get at convenience of Netflix. We have to kind of move with the times. In addition to that, you know, if you look at I'm thinking about money. I can literally move $50,000 right now easier than I can cast my vote. Well, I was at the case, right? That so, so at the end of the day, we have to literally be able to have a voting system that lends itself to pluralism, that we have to, uh, a voting system that lends itself to many, the majority of wage workers who are really the most vulnerable, right? Don't work a traditional nine to five. Many of them work um, different hours. I have a, I can actually offer that when we were in line in, in Georgia, one of the things that happened in, 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 um, um, in Georgia is that there was a woman who was a home health worker. She was a nurse. She had taken uh, her client who lived on a predominantly white side of town. She had taken her to vote. She, from the time she took her on a walker inside to cast her vote to come back out, she said it was a total of 13 minutes, right? It was that simple. She came back to her polling site during her lunch hour, which she had one hour to vote, she had been in line for 30 minutes and they were anticipating that she would be in line for two hours. And so here is a woman that actually assisted her patient in voting that literally she could not vote because of how she worked and who she was and on what side of town she lived, quite frankly, because the waiting time oftentimes in Black precincts is very different than other precincts. It's a reality. If it's those nuances, it's like death by a thousand cuts. And so what we have to do is really be able to fight for the expansion of the franchise, that at the mm -hmm. end of the day, why is it easier to actually move 
millions of dollars than it is something as something as simple as we can't figure out how to give free and equitable access to the vote. It's not a matter of we don't have the ability. It does. It's not a matter of the technology doesn't exist. It's a matter of political will. There is a group of people, a small group of, this, of people in this nation who have only seen that process of power being accessible to a few. And they have weaponized, they always come in voter suppression in three different ways. It is always around restricting access to the ballot in some form or fashion. It is always around creating a culture of fear. Like we see some of these vote, the, these laws that see to make, to criminalize groups to actually helping to educate folks. And the third has been to weaponize kind of administrative process where you can legalize something. Let's not forget, this is a nation that, that um, legalized three-fifths of a human being that de designated that Black people were three-fifths of a human being, like just because it's legal does not make it right. And so that's why we're actually shifting a whole different perspective around when we're talking about creating democracy, it's going to take the people literally saying that we're demanding democracy. Can I just Thank add you. just a couple of things to put an exclamation? The most effective method of voter suppression is long lines. And there was a study done 2014 that showed that um, just statistically, there is no doubt that in poor neighborhoods, in communities of color, people are, are waiting in line seven, eight times the length of time that white voters are. That is nothing but direct suppression. And when you think about it, it's the most effective one because People come to the polls and if they physically cannot stand in line or they cannot take hours off of work, they cannot vote. And there was actually a recommendation made in 2014 by a bipartisan commission that no one should have to wait in line to vote more than a half hour. That has been so abrogated, it has now become practically a game with these people. How many polling places can you close which old machines can you send to certain districts so that they can't be tabulated? And I would urge people as we're advocating for new and different ways to vote that we also focus on this issue because this is such a fundamental blatant example of voter suppression. And the other thing I would say is, um, I wrote about in the book, I wrote, mentioned Latasha and her group and other groups. The idea is, you shouldn't be looking for the magic candidate. You shouldn't be worried about adjusting the party. Oh, we have to get a little to the center. We have to get a little to the left. You have to change the electorate. Once you change the electorate, you don't need the magic perfect candidate who doesn't exist anyway. You just need people to vote their self-interest. And that was the revelation from Fair Vote Georgia. That's what's going on in Pennsylvania. That's what's happening um, all around the country. So. Don't play the game of saying, well, if we just fine tune, you know, like with all the dials and the switches to manufacture these perfect candidates or to have a candidate not talk about this because some, some group is going to get angry. That's the wrong way to do politics. You change the electorate. And because there is this wealth of what they call irregular voters or non-voters, if you get even a small fraction of those people engage, you will turn red states into blue states, red states into purple states. That's what happened in Georgia. That's what happened in Arizona. In Arizona, you saw a movement of Native American women who the roles exploded. They had many more people registered and the margin of victory there, just like the margin of victory in Georgia can really be attributed to these voter registration efforts to get new voters, voters of color, poor women, women on Indian lands into the political process. And that has to be the game. That has to be the, the goal because it'll take care of itself. People will vote for the candidate that best represents them. That is the beauty of democracy. If you can get back to a system in which People have equal access, equal opportunity to vote, um, and uh, equal knowledge about um, who the candidates are, what's going on, when the election date is, how you vote. So um, I cannot stress enough um, 
how vital these were in the outcome of the 2020 election. That election would never have been won without these types of, of actions. And my great fear is that people are tired, they've gone through COVID, they're a little exhausted, you know, just the psychic energy, and that they will lose some of this oomph. So I think we just have to inject a little bit of Latasha into every voter with that <laughs> excitement and that energy and give them that contagious excitement that this matters and that you can do something great for your family, for your neighborhood, for your country. Um, and uh, I think restoring a sense of possibility and of uh, excitement around um, the election is absolutely critical for an outcome that's going to result in uh, a more democratic process. Davida, I know that you have to move. I know you have to move along. But I, I wasn't able to answer your one thing about Philadelphia and knowing that we a have- A second question for you. So, yeah, go, so yeah. you go ahead and, and, and address what you want to address. But there was an, um, a question in the chat about what is it that we do? How do we motivate young people? Because that's exactly what I wanted to talk about. <laughs> uh, we are right now in the moment, uh, a study just came out, um, one in four high school students here in Pennsylvania who are eligible to vote are registered to vote. That's one in four. That number goes down below 15% in Philadelphia. So it is an institutional failure in this moment to bring young folks um, into this electorate to allow them to participate in democracy. And so we have work to do to engage young voters, be it in high school, be it in college, to get engaged in this moment. Um, there's opportunities that we have to just educate, provide a little education. Civics not being, being taught in school the same way as it was when we were growing up. And so we have a generation of, of folks who are not being um, engaged in this political process. And just a little bit of information goes a long way. I was in Greensburg, uh, Westmoreland County, right outside of Pittsburgh, about 45 minutes outside of Pittsburgh on Tuesday, having a conversation with college students there at the University of Pittsburgh at Greensburg about voting rights, about voting. You know, half of that room, half of those students were registered to vote. That's the good news. The bad news is half of those who were registered to vote have never cast a ballot. Uh, so there's an opportunity to do lots of work with our youth in this moment. I think about organizations like PA Youth Vote who are doing that in Philadelphia schools and other and others to make sure that we are talking to young folks and engaging them in this political process because this is the, the world we're leaving to them and they should be engaged in this. And if we're in a room and there are not young folks in that room with us, then we're not doing this properly when we're talking about voting and voting rights um, because they have so much to say and they have to have their needs met as well as they drown in student loan debt, as they do not have uh, clean water and air to breathe. Uh, so much for young folks to be engaged in the electorate about. And it's time that we bring them back into the fold. Okay, and, and yes, I, and we also know that when people start voting, at which point they start voting, it's, they, develop that muscle, the voting muscle. That means I did it the first time that I was eligible and, and those people will continue um, their voting record for the rest of their lives. So catching them as soon as they turn 18, I think is a really, really smart thing and really getting into the schools, doing voter registration in schools. Um, and um, when you wanna come to Philly, just give me a call, Kadita. Um, as a matter of fact, I'm, I need to put this out, out there now. July 26th at City Hall Courtyard, we're doing something called Civics Saturday. We're gonna have speakers, we're gonna have voter registration, we're going to have um, a voting machine demonstrations. And so I'd like for you, Kadita, to come and talk to um, the folks here in Philly. I would so, love to. I would love to. Thank you. So we're getting near time. And so I'd like to go with each of you having your parting words for what you want people to know. And so I'll start with you in, in this order, Jennifer, Natasha, and Kadita. The lesson that I learned in writing the book and the lesson from 2020 is democracy does not take care of itself. 
that it's like a garden. If you neglect it, the weeds will come in, nothing will grow, and you'll have a permanent famine. And although people say, oh, I'm so tired. I did all that work in 2020. I had to go through COVID. Yes, we're asking you again. You have to maintain it. It's like breathing. You br- you were breathing yesterday. You have to breathe again today. You ate yesterday. You got to eat again today. Um, and it's not that you're done, that you put forth this effort, that you get the right party in and then you can go home. That's not what it's about. It's a constant process. Muscle memory is a great way of putting it. Um, Just like people get into the habit, they run every day or they work out every day or they take a walk every day. Um, That's the pattern. That's the habit of democracy we have to to cultivate. And um, I think that the future and the future generations um, will absolutely have this down. We're having the millennial generation, the most diverse, the most educated, the most progressive, the most environmentally sensitive, but talking about a bridge, we have to get them there. Um, And we can't leave the garden in shambles um, for them to somehow try to reconstitute. Um, So I'll just end with my deep appreciation as an American, as someone who is a um, democracy defender for all the work that you ladies all do, um, because that's where democracy is going to get saved. It's not going to be in Washington. It's not going to be in some campaign uh, messaging machine. It's not going to be, you know, with a 30 second ad. It's going to be because we get a critical mass of people engaged in the system again. Thank you. Thank you for I having also me. Saw, thank you. I also saw a message in the chat. I gave the wrong date for Civic Saturday. It's July 23rd, not July 26th. So you're up, Latasha. So I'll just say that I think what can be instructive and learn from even some of the work that we did in, in Georgia is that, that at, we have a new coalition that is rising that is made up of white people and black folks and Latinas and indigenous people um, and the AAPI community that ultimately we should actually fight for the America that we desire and we deserve. And if it is to happen, we're going to have to make it be real and be so. And so in order for that to take place, I'll just end with, I have, I always talk about my V strategy. I have a V strategy. You remember four ways. The first one is around vision. You know, we've got to have a vision of what it is that we want, not just responding to what already exists. I mean, the founders were so limited in their vision, they couldn't even see the humanity and other people outside of themselves. So clearly that's not the vision that we should be on. We should create a new vision that is more inclusive, more equitable, and more just. And in order to have that, it's going to require us having a vision of what that looks like. If uh, every single person felt like that they were respected and valued, what does that look like? What does that America look like? You know, the second thing we have to have is we have to have voice. We have to literally in this moment, use our voice um, that we can't be quiet. We can't stand on the sidelines. We can't just see this as a transaction. We have to really recognize that we are creating the future that our children deserve, that we want them to have and the experience. The fourth thing is that even when we're talking about CTR and all those other pieces, that is going to require us to really have a value uh, p- position that we have to really recognize. It's not that I, I'm one of those ones that I don't think that Republicans are, they're much better at messaging. No, they have a mess. They have one message. Their message is we hate everybody that ain't white. Right. And men, right. And so at the end of the day, if that's if you can lie, you can use whatever you can lie. You don't you don't have any integrity that you got to be held to. Yeah, that might seem like you are a better messenger, but not necessarily. Right. At the end of the day, what I believe is that we certainly have a nuanced reality because we are seeking to be diverse. We are seeking to be actually of not just of one mind and one community, but of many communities come together. And that's more nuanced and that's more difficult, but it's also more beautiful and more powerful for us to seek that. But it does make our work a little bit harder. And the fourth and the final thing, we have to really see voting as not just as a transaction, but as one leverage point for us to win power. We've got to believe that we can win. We have to know we have to win and we have to recognize we're in protracted struggle, that this isn't about one candidate or one election. This is about shaping the the reshaping the entire political landscape so that when we're looking at the constitution, we know that we've made it be real. Thank you. Kadita, your final words. 
You know, we opened up tonight talking about American hero, um, Harry Tubman. And it, it can't go without being mentioned that we're commemorating the month of her birth and her passing here in March as we're closing out Women's History Month. And, you know, I think about the fact that she spent lots of time here in Pennsylvania, in Kennett Square, Chester County, in York County, um, in Philadelphia, in Montgomery County, Harriet Tubman spent lots of time here educating um, the electorate here uh, in the fight for women's suffrage and how we need to continue to fight for the right to vote for all Pennsylvanians who are eligible to do so. Uh, we are on the precipice of something uh, here in the Commonwealth, and we need to make sure that we are defending um, our voting rights in this moment while we still have them, uh, because the attempts to erode our voting rights and, and erode democracy in this moment is real. And so I just encourage everyone who is eligible to vote to get out there on May 17th and cast a ballot in the primary election and encourage someone else in your life who was not registered to vote to do so in this moment and cast their ballot on November 17th. Thank you. And May 17th, excuse me. May 17th, close, the Thank you very much. Um, and before we close, I'd like to bring on Vanessa Fields, who is the chair of the Philadelphia Commission for Women. And she is also the president of the Philadelphia chapter of the National Organization for Women. And she is a courageous and inspiring partner in our work together. Vanessa, you'll close us out. Okay, so this is the message that I got tonight. It is time to get in good trouble with intentional disruption to radically reimagine democracy. That's what I heard tonight, okay? So I wanna thank our amazing guests um, Jennifer Rubin, Latasha Brown, and Kadita Kenner. Ah, this was some fruit, food for my soul, food for my spirit. Empowered me, got me riled up to get, get out there and do the daggone work, okay? Thank you, ladies, so much. And I want to remind people that next month is Sexual Assault Awareness Month, um, and the Women's Commission has planned two activities. Um, till day on April the 7th and hands around City Hall on April the 29th. Um, registration for these events are in the chat. Um, also look for additional information for next month on mobilizing the Latino vote, um, which will be moderated by City Council member Maria Keones Sanchez. So everyone take care and register to vote and vote, register your grandma, your mom, your play cousin, register them vote and make sure they get out and vote. Make it a day, okay? Tell people right now, put in for your day off, okay? Good night. Good night and thank you. Welcome.